So as an avid birder and a technology enthusiast, and until about 13 minutes ago was the president of the Cuga Bird Club, please welcome Swan back to center stage. Thank you very much. Here we go. I think you've heard me talk enough, so let's just look at pictures. So it's a, for us a pie-built greed. You can also play along, and for especially beginner birders. This pretty bird with a nice purplish sheen to the face is a blue-winged teal. And this with this ridiculous, ridiculously long bill, though not as ridiculous as a woodcock, is a Wilson snipe. And this, to me, is the bird with the prettiest undertail coverts. It's checkered, but this is a black and white warbler. And this is, of course, a brown thrasher. Or is it? I looked on, on, on you know, um, siblings and then say, oh, there's also a long-billed thrasher that lives in South Texas, and they look almost the same. So I did not know what it was. And, but if you look at the ranges, the brown thrasher, they winter down in that corner of Texas, whereas the long billed thrasher creep up. So there's a zone of overlap where I was when I took that photo. But in the end, I think this is a brown thrasher, and we'll come back to see why I think that is. It looks like our brown thrasher, right? So. And also, talking about ridiculously long bills, this is the long billed curlew, which is just the most ridiculously long billed bird ever, and unless you look at, I guess, the hummingbird. With the... But yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't get this closer. So when I talk about South Texas, what am I talking about? Um, I'm talking about Corpus Christi, which is where I flew into, and I only went south from there, so I did not. It was even further south than the usual cities you hear about in Texas. And so here's in the Corpus Christi area where I flew into the airport, CRP, which I thought was an interesting three-letter code. And so the first place I went was to this refuge up here, Aransas um, National Wildlife Ridge Refuge. It, there's no K in there. The word looks a lot like Arkansas, but it's Aransas. And this place is famous for these birds, which are whooping cranes um, in March. And so whooping cranes were like critically endangered in 1941. There are only 22 individuals left of which 16 were in Aransas, and the other six in Louisiana eventually died. So basically, all of the recovery were just from those 16 in 1941. But slowly, they've been coming back, and I didn't know until I did this talk, like, oh, I better look at the number. Last year, the survey, they had eight, around 800 population, which is a record high, so this is the highest number it's been since then. So most of these are in the, so this is a range map from um, Birds of the World, and with all these three-letter um, abbreviations. So the main one is the Aransas wood buffalo pop, uh, population here, marked AWP. So Aransas is down in Texas. Wood buffalo is a national park in the far north end of Alberta, creeping into the Northwest Territories. And that population was about 500 in the last survey, and it's the only one that continues to be, and also self-sufficient. There are a number of reintroductions in the right side of this map. But all of these are, as, as I understand it, currently still not quite self-sustaining. They still need humans to help them survive. One of which is the eastern migratory population is the one where they actually fly these planes from Wisconsin to try to guide them down to the southern states. And you also have two non-migratory populations in Florida and Louisiana. And they're also not quite self-sustaining. So what happens if you go to Aransas National Wildlife Refuge? You have these towers, and I wasn't thinking I would give a talk, so I didn't take pictures of the sites. But I took pictures of this tower because of these pointy plastic things they put on the end of this, which is, of course, to keep the birds from pooping. But they find the thing that doesn't have the pointy thing, like this black vulture, and poop on it anyways. <laughs> but, but this is kind of what the tower looks out upon. And this is kind of the preferred habitat. Um, they go for these marshes and they look for um, um, blue crab to eat. But this place, if you go drive on your own, is not a great place to see the whooping cranes because they each, each family, each group usually pair with a juvenile 
we have a huge territory. I don't remember the number, it's like a square mile or something. So they will not tolerate another one anywhere near them. So if you go up to this lookout tower, at best, you may see a distant glint. So this was actually my second time up there and I didn't see any. I saw, this is kind of what you see. Oh, there are some distant white things. Are those whooping cranes? No, they're great egrets because of the crooked neck. And so I thought, okay, once again, I didn't see it. But actually this time, I didn't know until I reviewed my photos last week. It's like, wait a minute, that one is actually more upright. And I think that actually is a whooping crane. You see kind of the darkish face, pixelated. So not very satisfactory, is it? So you want to see whooping cranes like this, right? So how do you see that? So you have to take a boat tour to see it. Because basically from one stationary tower, at best, you get to be within one territory. But this boat tour from Rockport, which goes up this path, it goes from one territory to the next to the next. So they basically guarantee you will see a um, whooping crane or you get to come back the next day to try again. And the thing goes from November to March. There are two companies. There's a big one. If you just Google whooping crane tours, it'll show up. And that's the one I took. And the captain is actually a birder. And so it's actually a good birding tour. But he also recognizes the birder and non-birder audiences. So he'll talk about the lesser black bike gull that nobody cares. And then he'll talk about the whooping craze that everybody's happy. <laughs> but there's also a second smaller boat that supposedly gets you closer, which Diane and did um, very close to Charlie before I did. And so they also um, go close. But from what I hear, they're not very good birders per se, but they do know where the, about the whooping crane. So. Yes, and they do let you get really close to the boat. Yeah, it's a smaller boat, a more intimate setting, whereas my boat is about a dozen or more people. So we took this boat tour from Rockport, and up, up close next to the boat is this common loon. And on the pier is this neotropic cormorant, not a double-crested cormorant. How do you tell the difference? I guess it's got a longer tail, and I guess there's this kind of angled thing on the face, so it's very subtle and not necessarily easy to tell. But you know, the captain told us, so I took his word for it and took the picture. <laughs> there were also dolphins. And then, before long, we came across our first um, pair of um, um, whooping cranes. And uh, yeah. And so they're at moderate distance, and then we just keep going and try to find the next one. But actually, this captain was like, Oh, yeah, oh, don't look at those. Look at this exciting thing which rarely comes out, which is a clapper rail that for some reason had come out in the open to run around. So that was pretty cool. And then we saw other groups slightly closer. And I guess one way to tell from afar, even when the view isn't this good, is that the whooping cranes have a flat back compared to most other birds, out, white birds out there will be great egress or other egress. There's several egress species out there. And as one would come fly by, this is pretty neat. And, but there are also other interesting birds to see along the way. These are model ducks, which are kind of relatives of um, American black ducks, but they're ranged as a generous, generally southern bird. So not very exciting, but you know, out of range, you want to get it, check it off, you can go there to see it. And you also have little shoals and rock outcroppings, which are always a magnet for birds. So what all can you see here? So, yeah, the one, the needles are the black skimmers with the upside down bill, like the bottom bill is way longer than the top. We'll see more of that later. Also royal terns, laughing gulls. And those, I think, are common terns, to be honest. I can't really tell whether they're common or foresters, so I could be wrong. Feel free to correct me later. There's a leaf turn with a yellow bill. I think that's a sanderling. I'm not sure. Shorebirds, you know, peeps. But and actually, hiding behind those two laughing gulls, you have to tell the gull bill turn. So you know, it's just you know, so many species. And here's another one, and here's where the captain would say, look, here's a lesser black black gull, which is you know, not that common. And also in this picture, you can compare the neotropic cormorant, the double-crested cormorant, which is a little smaller, you can see. And this double-crested is actually in breeding, starting to have the breeding crests. And you have the laughing gulls, which are kind of the everywhere gulls down there. And also there was in this rock outcropping an American oyster catcher on a nest, which is kind of cool. 
and there were also coyote running around, so that was kind of cool. But that what we really wanted to see are the um, whooping cranes, you know, got up close. So basically we saw a bunch, but they were pretty far. But on the way back, we were lucky to see this pair super close, just foraging and just park the boat there forever, letting us enjoy it. You can see one of them has leg tags and transmitter to help track it, but the other one doesn't. So, And, you know, you can get super close. The one on the fa right, it looks like the face pattern is weaker, but it's actually because his face has been in the mud so much, it's mud covered. <laughs> and so I said, so the captain goes, they actually like um, blue crabs as their favorite meal. That doesn't have the legs of crabs, so I don't know what it is, but that does look like an interesting meal, that it, it, which I didn't really know until I looked back in the photographs, because I'm, I'm just snapping away. I took like 8,000 photos of this trip, so. And then, so while they were feeding, you saw from the right three other whipping cranes come in. So the two left, you, know, you may have noticed the one on the right, the head is slightly different color. So the two on the left are adults, and the one coming in is a juvenile with a slightly less developed head. So what's going on? So this is the original pair they took off, with the one with the leg band you can see. And this is the male from the other one. like, okay, you are in my territory. It's time to get out of here. So there was a chase. This photo on it sort of may look like a ballet, two dancing edges, actually one chasing the other out of its territory. And, and you can see the one on the left is actually vocalizing here. So that was really exciting end to our um, um, whooping crane boat tour. And then it's time to take the boat back, say another hi to the dolphins in that one area of the bay before returning to Rockport. And we were greeted at the pier by this brown pelican, which are just neat birds. So while I was in Rockport, I also so I did that too, and then I didn't, didn't really know where to go. I didn't really do too much research when I went down. But then, so I looked on Google Maps. Oh, there's a Rockport rookery. I wonder where that is. Just turns out to be this place where there's a rookery of both great blue herons and great egrets. And here's a great blue heron doing a display. And here you can see a great egret with the, with the plumes all out and doing display. And occasionally they'll disagree and kind of fight each other. But here's a video. I think the audio is not working, but it's all wind noise anyway, because it's very windy. But the uh, great egret doing the display. And then it's gonna, it's gonna shake his body, I think. Yeah. Okay, so I, I kind of driven to Rockport the night before back to my hotel after dinner, and I noticed this little pull off with a sign called Cove Harbor, so I didn't know whether there was anything, but it was like a place you could access. So the next morning at dawn, I went there. One advantage, whenever I go west of here, I stick with East Coast time, so it's easy to wake up early. And so this place turned out, I mean, it wasn't like special, special, but there's still a lot of birds. Like these are all dowagers, and I'm not a short build, long build differentiator to treat them all equally, so it's kind of neat to see this. But one neat thing there is that there are these two white ibises that started having a fight. And so you get this pretty picture, but it got a bit nasty. It's like, it's like I didn't know. It's like, yeah, you. And the brown, you may see the brown spots. Those are all from the mud kicked up from their fight. But eventually, one declared victory. Yay. And I think that's a dowager in the upper left, just from Reveal Hill. And also, as the sun rose, you have perfect light to photograph this tricolored heron. And but also looking into the light, you know how you have these guy who's trying to teach you birds by shape. Just take this photo. You have the shape of a dowager spur. I'm thinking short bill because of the flat back, but I don't know that's sufficient to conclude this. I, I think the long bills look like they have swallowed a grapefruit, is what I'm told. And. So I think this is a short build, but please correct me if you think you can conclude what this is. And then you have this peep spur, which I think is a least sandpiper, just from this thin down curved bill. So another thing you can see on the map in Port Aransas, not too far from Corpus Christi, is the Leonabel Turnbull Birding Center. 
and this is just a plat and you, the drive there is kind of funny you go through a neighborhood and you go by this giant water tank basically it's an out discharge from some water treatment and you have this nice boardwalk and you're just looking upon a whole bunch of birds that get super close that you can totally see and appreciate even without binoculars. So this is a totally great place just to get people into birding because the binoculars are the big um, hindrance to getting people into birding. So there are also a bunch of white pelicans, American white pelicans there hanging out among a lot of other birds. So some of the more interesting thing, birds are the black neck stilts. There are like a lot of them there and just walking around everywhere. And a similar looking bird is the American avocet. And if you don't know about these, they're the ones we have this up curved bill. Here's a couple of them. And so, you know, you have the black neck still right close, super close. It's like all the, a lot of photos here are top down because I'm on this platform and they're just flying underneath me and I'm trying to photograph them as they go by. Yes? I do not know, to be honest. The question was, what is the advantage of the upturned bill for an American apposite? And my answer is, I don't know. Yeah, it's just they choose to feed a certain way. Yeah. I have seen them just kind of waving back and forth, but maybe when they're this tall and you want your bill to be parallel, leaning, just do that, I guess. That's a guess. But you also have this white ibis just preening are super close and then you have a lot of birds bathing and after they bathe they do the flaps you can see this blue winged teal with a nice blue patch on top so just remember that the blue winged teal, teal still has a green speculum so it's not the color of the speculum but the blue feathers on the upper part and this green winged teal with the light it's almost like hummingbird quality iridescence hmm. and here's it flapping very fine yeah, patterning on the body. And the fly by Northern Shoveler also, we normally are you know, distracted by the giant honking bill, but their wings are pretty neat too. The wing pattern is almost the same as the blue wing teal, actually, with the blue wing on top and the green speculum. And here's another tricolored heron. And this is a reddish egret. And if you don't know, the reddish egret has two morphs. There's also a dark morph, so, and the one on the right I took of one it was during the whooping crane boat tour, actually. So, and yeah, I don't remember the pro proportion, but you can see they have similar colored bills. But another guest at the this Leona Turnbull Birding Center is this guy. But the birds kind of know that it's slow and how quickly it can go, so. Especially, you see those two stilts behind it, they, they like to follow it because as it moves, I guess it churns the water and brings up food that they'll just follow and pick at. So here, these guys are in. So, I've watched this guy forever, and here's a neat video of what, um, which I thought was neat. Oh, the drama. <laughs> I couldn't decide whether, as a photographer, I wanted the kill shot or not. So, By the way, that was taken with a smartphone, so that was close. That wasn't like big lens distance. So anyways, you have these crackles down there, which are the great tail crackles. I guess I forgot for the name. So we have the common grackle. You go a bit south, you get the boat tail grackles, and you go further south, you get great tail grackles. So the tails get bigger and the birds get more annoying. As I've been told, they make a lot of noise, interesting noises, but you see them a lot do this build up behavior. It's, it's part of the courting or dominance thing, which I thought was neat. 
And then out in the corner, I saw this guy. You don't know what this is? It's a scissor-tailed flycatcher. And then it was first I saw it far, and then weight came closer, and then it started flying around. And then you can see the tail split. And then it started flying right over the head. And the behavior is just like the typical flycatcher. It would come out, catch a bug, and go back. But then it was so close, I could not focus on the things. Like you would, I'd either get a pretty good focus, but partly out of frame, or I get this great shot, but it's not in focus. Although these days with software, you can cheat, and like this Topaz AI thing will actually sharpen it for you. So the one on the right is kind of good, but it feels kind of like cheating, right? <laughs> But then I finally did this, get this money shot, which I think is the best because it shows the rear view, which is all the fine and the colors. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Oklahoma State Quarter, it has the bird on it, but you know, it doesn't look quite the same without the color. Yeah, yes? Um, Leona Bell Turnbull. Yeah, birding center. Just Port Aransas, look for a birding center. But yeah, this was the more lucky hit. I don't think you. Uh, I don't know where necessarily you see the um, scissor tail fly catchers. Just randomly encounter them. I was lucky here that it came super close right above for photos. So that's a summary of the area around Corpus Christi that I went to. I also went to Padre Island National Seashore, which is North Padre Island, just off of Corpus Christi. I did went there mainly for windsurfing. Although in the past trip, I have seen. Um, lesser night hops again in, during during the day but i didn't get to photograph it unfortunately so from there i went down to the lrgv a place so great they give it a, the birders identified by letters which is the lower rio grande valley and also south padre island where i was meeting some college friends and so just so you know the lay of the land between these two is about 150 miles or two and a half hours drive um, so a lot of people who just want to um, bird down in the lower part can fly into McAllen, which is a decent sized airport also. But really you can also do this, although in the drive there's really nothing in between. Well, not quite nothing, there's a lot of wind farms on, on the way, which is on the one hand pretty neat and know that's sustainable. On the other hand, it's part of the uh, flyway for bird, migratory birds, so there's concern whether that's a problem. So, well, it's there. and. And this is hope for the best. So the next section is the South Texas specials of the Lower Rio Grande Valley. And by specials, I just mean birds that you can only see there and nowhere else in the US. So starting with this popular guy, the green jay, spectacular. Here's one drinking water from a little watering hole. And this one's caught a bug, which I think is a bug bug. And so the range of this bird is kind of scattered all over a lot of Central America, but it, you can see it just eats up in just a little bit of Southern Texas. Plain chachalaca, it's kind of like a miniature turkey, whatever, that's very noisy. But it's, you, you can see it fans its tail, it's kind of neat. It's very noisy here, just screaming. <laughs> Yeah, this is a kind of fixture of Central America. If you go to like Belize, it's also everywhere. But again, the range just creeps up to South Texas. Great Kiskadi. This is like the neotropical everywhere bird pretty much. And again, just creeping up to South Texas. So actually after my drive from the Corpus area down to close to McAllen, after the drive, I just, okay, I'll just look up a park, just go there just for rest before I went to the hotel. First thing I went up, got out of the car, I heard the kiskadi call. Kiskadi, kiskadi. So I was like, okay. Now I know I'm in a different bio zone. And this one, what is it? Uh, tropical kingbird? Western kingbird? You have to look up and say, oh, the birds you find in South Texas are couches kingbird. But really, one way to tell is by the sound. And they make this sound, which to me sounds almost like a Western wood peewee. And again, the range is Central America, just South Texas. I guess it goes more South Texas here. And Olive Sparrow, which is another South Texas special. You only get the range up there. In all honesty, it's kind of the boringest of the <laughs> um, test specials. But I guess it's neat to have this sparrow that is totally on. The back has none of the typical brown model sparrow look. And this is a clay-colored thrush 
just a really a plain, boring looking bird, but it's kind of like the robin of the Central America. The range is most of Central America, again, just up to the Rio Grande Valley and no much, not much more. So it's like the bird that wakes up in the morning and sings the cheerily cheerio, just like our robins. So here's the white tipped dove, whose range again, a lot of South Central America, but creeps up just to South Texas. And it's rather plain looking compared to a, another dove that's a little more rangy, which is a white winged dove. You, uh, you can just see the white wing bar right there. And the range, is, you, see, you see it a lot, a lot more in the southern US. So this, the net, those neck lines are not typically what you see. I think this one has been attacked and lost a lot of neck feathers, so it normally looks better. But in my short time down there, this was the only one that cooperated for photos. Because you see them a lot, you try to creep up, they fly off. And I wasn't really too patient in trying to hunt down these dove photos. And you have the common ground dove, which is another fixture of Central America. So Jody pointed out at the meeting that what I had identified here as the common ground dove was in fact an Inca dove. So I looked it up after the fact, and it turns out there are two to three kinds of small doves um, that can be found in Texas that look similar superficially. They all have flashy reddish wingtips when they fly. Um, it's a common ground dove, the Inca dove, which is pictured here, and there's also a ruddy ground dove, which is rare. It's actually more south. The range is further south, but they do, they do creep into Texas sometimes. So thank you, Jody, for the correction, and now on with the show. Great. You also have buff-bellied hummingbird, which, um, again, the range is mainly in South Texas, but they, I guess they'll winter in also some of the other parts of the southern U.S. So you kind of get a theme here. Basically, there are a lot of birds range just up to South Texas, nowhere else. So if you are doing, say, a big year in the US, United States, you basically have to go there to take off these, all these species that you, you can't find anywhere else. Oops. And so this one is an Altamira oriole. This range again is as shown. Here's another view with the front. And this one, slightly different, longer tail, bigger wing bar, and bigger black mark is a hooded oriole, which is, has a bigger range. I've seen them in California. And the gold-fronted woodpecker, which is basically a relative of a red-bellied woodpecker, and in both cases, I don't know that you think of the gold front as the distinguishing feature, so it's like our red-bellied. But I guess it took a while for me to learn that when you have these white-fronted E's, gold-fronted woodpeckers, the front is talking about this part, not this part. This is not the front, this is the front. And, but this one ranges a little farther in Texas. You have the ladderback woodpecker, whose range is, I guess, much more restricted, but occupies more of South Texas. And here we have the long-billed thrasher. Remember what I said earlier, these, how the range overlap. So it's easier to conclude that it's a long-billed thrasher when you get, if you look on the left side, the brown thrasher doesn't go south beyond Corpus Christi. So once you get down there, it's pretty much a long-billed thrasher. And here is a comparison of that brown thrasher to the left earlier and the long bill. It's mainly the color. Like the our brown thrasher has this reddish hue and almost reminds me of a female cardinal when I see it flash by real fast. Whereas the long bill is a darker brown. Also heavier streaks and probably other subtle differences I didn't bother looking up or remembering. And cute little titmouse is a black crested titmouse, which I guess is only very limited in range to Texas and northern Mexico. So this is kind of the lay of the land of um, the lower Rio Grande Valley. I guess you can keep birding to the upper Rio Grande Valley. There are also other things. So I didn't find everything, but you know. So I guess I didn't really give the background of this. I decided I would go a week to Corpus Christi. I knew I wanted to windsurf, and then I'll rent a car and do some birding. And then my friends were like, oh, my college friends who live in Texas like, oh, let's go to South Padre Island. So suddenly my seven days were trying to do some for windsurfing, some for meeting friends. So I only had like really five days of birding, and I was too lazy to do research. There was a Facebook group that says, yeah, just go to these, just go to these places. And I did, and I was like, 
I hear about these vegetables, I actually see them, they were super easy to see because they were feeders, so I didn't have to try really hard. And so when Laura asked me to give this talk, she actually had seen some Facebook posts I had from photos from Bon Air, which were like pretty birds. I wanted to give a talk on that. I'm like, yeah, they are pretty, but they're eight species. I don't think I can do like a 45-minute talk on eight species. But this kind of one-week trip that got shortened to just four to five days, I got like 8,000 photos of like high-quality photos of so many species, like easy to get a good talk. Well, it's hard because I have too many photos. I don't know if I can squeeze them all in. But these are some of the places I went to. Benson, Rio Grande Valley in the west, Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge, Sabal Palm Sanctuary. These have a similarity in that they're all in the floodplain of the Rio Grande. So these are um, satellite images, and the yellow line is the Rio Grande. And it's very easy to tell. I didn't have to draw the boundary where these sanctuaries are. They're the green spots. And because in the floodplain, they basically they can flood every now and then. And so what happens, the red line marks where the wall is. So basically they have to build the wall on that side. So to go to these places, they basically have to cross, go past the wall. Santa Ana, you see, is missing the red dot because we actually got in the legislation uh, a clause that said um, you cannot build the wall in the Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge. They were still trying to build it maybe on the other side of the levee, just outside the boundary, but wasn't there. So to go to each of these, you go past this, which is kind of pretty, you know, you, I don't know whether you noticed in the very intro photo, it's actually this, a lot of great tailed grackles hanging out on the wall behind the sunrise because, again, I was waking up early. And so other places I went, there were basically this Facebook group suggested go there was Estirogianos Grande. And actually, I basically just spent one day in a couple of these places this evening. And I was like, I've already seen so many things. Will I see anything different over here? Well, I saw these guys. <laughs> Anybody know what these guys are? This is a tricky. Yeah, these are black-bellied whistling ducks. And this place had tons of them. And tons of them, which is neat. And, and I should have and try to get a good recording, but they just do these little whistles. So in, it's a very pleasant sounding racket over there when you go to this place. The place also had other birds, but I didn't have to find them, like the common parake. There was a guy there asking, can you find one for me? And he helped look and didn't see it. I didn't have time to just wait till evening, I guess, because those are easy to find in the evening. I was told instead in the evening to go to Oliveira Park uh, near Brownsville or in Brownsville itself, actually, which is where a lot of parrots come in to roost in the evening. Yeah, again, that was an iPhone video, and my iPhone, for some reason, the audio is kind of glitchy, but basically, the you have to wait till dusk for them to come. But I was able to get some photos, including the red lord parrot. Now, these aren't native to there per se. They're escapees, but the range is pretty close. This is the range, according to Wikipedia, goes up close, but so it may not be a natural range. And you also have white-fronted parrots, whose range is further south in Mexico, but they're escapees because parrots are popular pets. And there were at least a couple of other species known to be there, but only a couple of individuals. Most were these two. And, and the differences are like subtle. It's like yellow eyes, instead of red eyes. So in that big flock, can you find the one with the yellow eyes? I think I did find it, but by the time I brought my camera up, I couldn't find it again. So. And then I also went to South Padre Island, which is more well known for spring break, which is a beach. But there, are, there is a, the hotel I lived in happened to be right across the street from the birding center. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what the birding center is like. So it's just another place where the birds come super close. And although they're not necessarily special, but meaning these, uh, these are birds you cannot find even in New Jersey because they are generic coastal birds that you got really close to them, like this black skimmer. And this photo, I actually like, if you look at the lower bill, you can see those dots just from the reflection. I guess it's got ridges. And so, so this is not actually the typical skimming behavior. They, where they fly past and, and just swoop. This one seemed to be going a little deeper. I don't know whether it's a juvenile trying to learn to skim or whether it was doing something else. 
But so this photo I thought interesting because I did not know that the fills were skinny in this direction. It's kind of like oyster catches. You know, oyster catches are like flat in this direction so they can go into an oyster and scoop it. This one, I guess, makes it more hydrodynamic so when they skin, it only slices through the water, then, which I didn't know. And then you have this tricolored heron sitting on this boardwalk. How close was it? Yeah, so you let you get really close for some nice detailed photos. And then here is a marble godwit that caught something, not sure what. Roseate spoonbills. And I chose this photo because I kind of see the back lighting through the bill and see some of the veins in there. So this, again, is the reddish eager we saw earlier. It looks like it's dancing on water. So, and so the reddish egret. So the, here the wind was blowing, so when it's blowing behind, you can see it looks kind of fancy. But what is it doing? So reddish egrets are known to behave, to hunt very differently from most other egrets and herons who just kind of stand quietly and snap. These guys will actually chase, 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 and try to catch fish that way. So it would chase, 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 and eventually catch a fish in this case. And then I went along the beach and you had royal tern. You often see them do this kind of strange posture. I think it's some kind of courtship thing. You have a lot of le least terns with the yellow bills. These are small birds. And then I saw this pair again. I think they're common terns because I don't know if that's a especially based on the top word, but saw one diving. I think these two, I couldn't tell, these two were kind of next to each other. The bottom one dove, came up with a fish. I'm not sure you can see you got a small fish, and the top one kind of came along, kind of came close, but you know, they don't steal from each other. One of those is a partner saying, oh, good job, or I don't know what. It was kind of interesting. And the thing I love about turns is after they dive, they come out, they have to do a shake. So here are a couple of shots of the shake after they dive. Yeah, and, and even around here, when you see the Caspian turns, watch them, it's fun. The ospreys do the same thing. And so we have a wimbro, which is only the, it's a miniature version of the long bill curlew I showed earlier. It's, but it's still a pretty big um, down curved bill. So one place bef before I drove back up was the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. And here, um, just a scene, you can see there are a lot of windmills in the back, a lot of American coots in the front. And what's that thing over there? Oh, it's got another gator. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as I drove up, I, and at this point I didn't notice it sooner because I saw this strange shape by the side of the road. What is that? It was this road rather sunning itself. By the time I realized, stopped and pulled out my camera, it had realized, stood up and started running away. But I at least got this shot. And then also saw in the bushes a verdon, which is kind of a bird of the west. The first time I saw a verdon out west, I thought it was a blue-winged warbler because of the yellow face, and, but, but then it was a different body. And this guy, you know, know what this is? One of the um, challenging brown warblers that's also boring that doesn't actually get any better than this is an orange-crowned warbler. But here, actually, I actually saw some orange crown well, he's reddish in the crown. I've never seen that before. And this is a red-winged blackbird, but it's a color form of it that never we don't see up here. So I didn't have time to do the full research. I think it may be a subspecies thing. They have several different populations, slightly different color. If somebody knows better, feel free to share. Okay, so this is kind of my bookmark where I could have ended the talk if I couldn't squeeze all this, but I think we have time so we can just go and see. How do, so how do we get to see so many photos as feeders? They put up these feeders in all these places, but they do, it is seasonal, so you want to check because I think I heard them say when I was there in mid-March that that was this last weekend they would put up the feeders. 
So their main season is the winter months. I think after that, it started to get too hot and people don't want to go down there anymore or something. And so you have here, you have the Altamira Oriole going to the feeder, the plain Chachalaca going to the feeder, red winged blackbird, a lot of red winged blackbirds down there going to the feeder. I still remember my first trip down there, I was still learning sounds and I heard the pew call and I didn't know what made it. And I was in Texas, I thought maybe they're different new species. I spent like 40 minutes looking through the leaves only to see that it's a red winged blackbird. <laughs> but I never forgot that sound ever since, so he learned something. And not only that, but that's actually their aerial predator alarm call. So now if you hear them, you know to look up look for a predator. But you know, because of these, they have this bark butter stuck into the feeder that the, these perching birds can't easily get to. You'll see them hovering to peck at them. So including the cardinal here, you get some nice hovering cardinal shot. And here's the cardinal drinking from a watering hole. So I found that in these dry places, basically water is life. So anywhere where you can provide water and habitat, you, it becomes an oasis and you get a concentration of birds. I also have some other wildlife. This is a javelina, which is some kind of wild boar-ish animal. And also, white-eyed vireos. There were a lot of white-eyed vireos everywhere, heard, very few showing themselves. Like just from the first day when I went to Aransas, I was hearing them starting to learn how their song, because we don't get them here, I don't really know their song. So I heard this strange sound. I finally thought I got it. But I wanted a photo, and it never cooperated until the very end. So I want to please cooperate. So pop quiz, what sparrow is this? Yep, it's a Lincoln sparrow with the buffy thing that kind of goes around and leaves a white spot in the middle. So there are turkeys in this park that are just, and there are these people doing yoga, and they're like, yeah, we want to do it too, or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> And so in the Sabah Palm Sanctuary, one of the, the one southernmost point in Brownsville is actually near, it was off the road called Southernmost Road because it's near the southernmost point in Texas. You have all these old palm trees that leave their stumps. And so here in the bottom, you can see there's a cavity. And so this black belly whistling dog probably lives in there. I don't know, it looks too small for it. But I think they are cavity nesters. But also right next to it, it's another cavity with a parrot in. They definitely are cavity nesters. So this one's probably living in there. So here's a laughing cow that got its head put on wrong, I guess. <laughs> like, you know, should we know that um, birds have like twice as many neck vertebrae than we do all birds. So we know that owls can turn their head all the way around, but all other birds pretty much can't do it because they have the neck to be flexible, they can preen, they can turn the head upside down, it's kind of neat. And this is a closer view of a gull-billed turn that was in that um, Port Aransas Leona Bull Turnbull Birding Center. Easy one to overlook when you have all these birds all over to see what's going on. So it was also the two different pelicans being next to each other, and you can see the size difference, the American white pelicans bigger than the brown pelican. And they were actually kind of bathing. So, like. Okay, so I guess I can show this video of what the feeder looks like. I'm not sure if the audio comes through, but let's see. Yeah, this is all iPhone, so you can do slow-mo. Yeah, you can tell these birds are not made to stand on hanging stumps, but they try anyway. Um, I think it's bark butter, which I'm not super familiar with that, so peanut butter-ish thing, I think.
quick in and out for that one. Yeah, like how the green jay stabs at the bark butter. If you notice when they hover, they try to keep their head steady. Just to, all birds do that, try to keep their head steady as much as possible. Okay, and so here's some still having fun out there. Okay, yeah, I, was, yeah, I took so many videos, even though I didn't want to because editing videos is a pain, but there was just so much entertainment, uh, but I only, I'm glad I was able to share some of it with you, so thank you very much. <laughs>